Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeremy Travis. I'm the president of John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and I'm very pleased to welcome all of you, friends and family and <coughs> colleagues and students, uh, to this event, which commemorates the 30th anniversary of the swearing-in of Benjamin Ward. Let me just talk a bit about how we have planned the afternoon and make some uh, last-minute announcements as to some of the changes in our program so that you'll see um, why things are not quite as advertised. Um, if you'll note in the program, we, we have a number of uh, speakers, a small number, and all of us will speak just a short time, um, to, um, in the case of Larry Sullivan, our chief librarian, who will talk about the papers that we have now received from the Ward family. Uh, they're now being archived in the uh, John Jay Library. Uh, Greg Thomas, who is the uh, first vice president of Noble, National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, will talk a bit about uh, uh, Commissioner Ward in the context of, of that organization. And we are co-sponsoring, I'm very proud to co-sponsor this event uh, with Noble and welcome uh, Greg to, our, to the podium. Uh, and then we have a special treat, which is uh, Ben Ward's daughter, Mary, uh, will share some, uh, some reflections about, uh, about her dad. Uh, and it's through Mary that we have uh, been archiving the papers that we're putting on display uh, out in the other room and are here now available for uh, historians and students uh, of the future. So the two announcements of a change in program go like this. Uh, we received word about an hour and a half ago that uh, Mayor Dinkins is feeling a little tired at the end of the day, a very stressful day for him. Uh, I gather traffic is really awful in the city, so he was backed up and didn't get home and he thought he'd have time to put his feet up to put his feet up. So he's not going to be with us uh, this afternoon, but he sends his uh, best wishes to everybody and his regrets. And I've just made uh, what in coaching we'd call a last minute substitution, uh, that we're going to uh, ask uh, David Scott to come and, uh, and take that seat at the table to talk about uh, Ben Ward as, uh, as a police leader and as a, as a um, public official. And you did agree, Dave, to do that, yes? Just I want to make, this public, public pressure really does come, come in handy at a moment like this. Uh, so, uh, and the other announcement is that at about five o'clock or so, we expect a special guest. Uh, Commissioner Bratton has uh, just told us he'd like to come and say a few words uh, to this group uh, commemorating uh, the 30th anniversary of another police commissioner being sworn in, uh, Ben Ward, whom he knew. Uh, so that's a nice, you know, a nice surprise. Uh, so that's what uh, we have planned. So with your understanding, we're going to Everyone knows, right? We, we sort of grew up this way. When the police commissioner comes, everything else is going to stop, right? So when the police commissioner comes, whether I'm speaking or Sam Roberts is facilitating the panel, uh, we're just going to stop and ask uh, Commissioner Bratton to come and say a few things because he's squeezing us in on his way to another event uh, in the Bronx. So the panel, which I, the aforementioned panel, will include others who are coming. Hello, familiar faces. Uh, Police department has just arrived, look at this. Uh, uh, the panel will include, uh, I'm very pleased to say, uh, Herb Sturz, uh, who is the former Deputy Mayor of Criminal Justice, founder of the Vere Institute of Justice, and now at Open Society Foundations, uh, and played, as you'll see from his narrative, a pivotal role in the career of Ben Ward. Uh, Marty Horn, so the number of us in the room uh, who consider ourselves uh, protégés um, of Ben Ward, and Marty is among them. Now a distinguished lecturer here at John Jay and formerly uh, Corrections Commissioner for the city, Probation Commissioner for the city, and Executive Director for the New York State Division of Parole, but worked for uh, Commissioner Ward when he was State Corrections Commissioner. So we'll bring that perspective. Uh, and Dave Scott, uh, former Chief of Department uh, for, the, for New York City, uh, and um, also I think he would call himself a protege of, of Ben Ward. So we have a wonderful discussion, and the uh, indomitable, uh, um, Irreplaceable, wonderful Sam Roberts, uh, who writes for the New York Times and covers history and justice and everything else, will be the moderator. So that's the plan. Everyone signed on? So I can't help but uh, notice the uh, number of uh, familiar faces in the room. So just show of hands, how many people worked for Ben Ward at one time or other? So that's quite remarkable. So, uh, so we all know what a special experience we're talking about. You want them to stand up? Hilde, Hilde wants you all to stand up. So see. Who can say that they worked for Ben Ward? So this is a long-term long influence and, and legacy. Hi, Jackie. Uh, so we should all wish for so much. 
So, so let me just place uh, today's uh, uh, discussion in appropriate context. Uh, it was, as I said, 30 years ago uh, last month that another mayor, uh, Ed Koch, named another new police commissioner, Benjamin Ward, uh, well into his term, not his first police commissioner, his second. Let's just remember those years. Uh, the city was still reeling from the body blows of the fiscal crisis. The police department was dispirited after years of successive cuts to the budget, layoffs of police personnel, outdated radio cars, and inoperable communications equipment. The city administration was defending the police department against a congressional investigation led by Congressman John Conyers into allegations of police brutality, racism, and differential police service. The public view of the police was still colored by the revelations of the Knapp Commission a short decade prior, showing systematic corruption practices in various units and levels of the department. And hard to believe, but at that time, the word crack was not yet known. And the crack epidemic would not start for another year. But the problem of drug addiction, particularly to heroin, fueled high levels of crime, particularly street robberies, and spawned notorious open air drug markets in poor communities across the city. So it was a challenging time for the mayor, for Mayor Koch, and for his new police commissioner. Ward was certainly deeply experienced and well prepared for the job. A former corrections commissioner for the state and the city, former deputy commissioner for trials and community affairs in the NYPD, former chief of the housing police, and an up by the bootstraps story that culminated in a police career and a law degree, Ward was certainly prepared for the toughest of assignments. Now, the six years that he served as police commissioner ranged from exhilarating to rocky, as he took on the challenges of rising crime rates and suffered the uncompromising glare of public scrutiny. So in my view, personal opinion, his approach to policing, a requirement for high professional standards, for active engagement with the community, and creative strategies to control crime, that that approach set the foundation for the subsequent transformation of the NYPD that we have witnessed to this day. So we gather today at a time when a new mayor has appointed his own police commissioner. And we are gathered to reflect on those years and the legacy of Ben Ward. Now, I count myself among the many fortunate people in this room whose lives were touched by Benjamin Ward. I served as his special assistant at the Pretrial Services Agency of the Vera Institute of Justice, and then as special counsel when he was police commissioner, and continued close and a very special contact with him and his family all those years since our first meeting. He was mentor, a friend, inspiration, and a very stern teacher. So I consider it a personal honor in my present capacity to be able to host this event and to welcome so many others whose lives were touched directly or indirectly by Ben Ward. So please join me in welcoming to the podium our chief librarian, Larry Sullivan, who will talk about the, the papers that we've received and what is on display outside. Larry Sullivan. Thank you, President Travis. I did not work for Ben Ward. However, as a historian here in the 1980s, I knew all about his key role in the police department and the life of the city. And as a librarian, I was extremely happy when President Travis put me in touch with Mary Ward, Ben's daughter, about the paper she had. And with alacrity, I called. And over a number of years, we received uh, a number of papers, um, including some of the ones that are outside. And many of them are, for instance, the oral histories and his unpublished autobiography tell you a lot, maybe more than some people would want to know about what he thought and his ideas about policing and some people, et cetera. Um, ben, ben Ward was a very blunt person. Many of you who worked with him probably knew that. And he was not shy about talking about people. I spent a lot of time reading these papers to get a to prepare for this, uh, this uh, session, et cetera. And I learned a lot myself. And we're very pleased, though, to have them. And we have his 
autobiography, some pages out there, a lot of the photographs, etc. But what makes me even happier is that in our, our library is the best criminal justice library in the world. And special collections put us at the, really at the top rank. Special collections mean the archives that are out there, things like that. And what we have gathered over the years are a number of papers and collections that just buttress each other. One collection doesn't make for a research uh, institution. However, a number of collections do. So when, when Mary Ward got to me, or I got to her, let's put it this way, Jeremy Travis got to me, I got to Mary Ward, and we have had a rela our phone relationship, mostly Mary Ward and I, about these papers, because she's down in Florida. So I was so pleased because not only do we have things like the Ben Ward papers, and I don't have to talk too much about them because you're going to see them. You saw them beforehand. You will see them in the reception. And, but to buttress, and they all support each other. We have the Jim Fife papers. Jim Fife was the deputy commissioner for training under, and a faculty member at John Jay, very important papers. We have the com former commissioner Pat Murphy's papers, and we also have the entire 30-year archive of law enforcement news, which was the top law enforcement journal or newspaper in the country at the time. And we keep adding to this, like we have policemen's notebooks and from early 20th century on up, we have become the top place for police research in the country and the history of policing. And Ben Ward's paper is really kind of almost a capstone, especially so much of this has been unpublished. And he became commissioner at a time when you know, New York was going through a number of problems. And we can see that, and he talks about it, as I said before, very frankly. And so I'm so happy to have them. And I welcome all of you to come to the library. We also have a permanent, not permanent, but it's on exhibition, a number of cases in the library of other materials of Ben Ward. So this is, this is a collection that is so deep and so rich for research, and I'm so pleased to have it. And I learned so much myself in preparing for this, reading through all the papers. And as I said, his autobiography, we have a manuscript and it's unpublished. So I just whet your appetite to see what Ben may have said about some of you here. <laughs> and it is my pleasure just again to be here and to talk about the papers just a little bit. Thank you very much. So Greg Thomas won't say this about himself, so I'm going to say it about him on his behalf. So he's here representing Noble, uh, but we're also very pleased to let this audience know, if you didn't know already, that he's just been selected uh, by the new DA in Kings County, uh, Ken Thompson, uh, to be the Director of Law Enforcement Liaison? Operations. Uh, very good friend of the college, uh, as, and very active and, and noble, which is one of the ways, many ways we know each other. Uh, and I was honored to be invited to a meeting with uh, Mr. Thompson recently uh, with, uh, with Greg at the table. And what they're going to do together in Kings County is, is really spectacular. So he's here in another capacity, but uh, we're very pleased to, to see that he's taking this role in our city. Greg. Uh, thank you, President Travis. Good afternoon, President Travis and members of the Ward family and invited guests. It's my pleasure to be here to bring greetings to you on behalf of the National President of Noble, Chief John Dixon, and our first National President, Chief Alexander, in DeKalb County, Georgia. And let me correct for the record now, the program says I'm first National Vice President. Constitutionally, I get sworn into that role in July, so we're close, uh, but it's good. And then sworn to the National Presidency next year, so I'm, I'm in the chain of command, as it were, to be uh, National First Vice President by July, so thank you for that, that reference. It's my honor to represent them, the entire Noble National Executive Board, and thousands of our members across the world as we celebrate and honor the life of the late Benjamin Ward, a longtime Noble member and the first African American Commissioner of the New York City Police Department. When you, use, when, you, uh, when you use as a noun, excuse me, Webster's Dictionary defines the word pioneer as a person who helps create or develop new ideas or methods, or as someone who is one of the first people to move to and live in a new area. So using these definitions, this dictionary 
also goes on to provide examples of pioneers, like those pioneers who settled in the American West in the 19th century, but they also go on to provide other research in reference to hardships that these pioneers endured while they, while in many cases were in search of land or of, of land that held gold, that precious find that, like the Powerball of our times, provided those who found it a way to make dreams come true. When you dive deeper into the examples provided, you will find names that have become household names when one thinks of pioneers or explorers. So for example, William Clark and Meredith Lewis teamed together to embark on what has become as known as the Lewis and Clark Expedition. And during their trek from the West in the 1800s to 1804 to 1806, soon after the Louisiana Purchase, they kept detailed maps and diaries studying the animals, plants, terrain, and the various challenges they encountered. Now, while there's not much reference to them, made to them, African Americans also played a role in exploration and made many trips west in search of a better way of life. Life on the frontier was generally hard for everyone, but African Americans often faced the extra burden of racism, which made them have to redouble their efforts to make a way for themselves and their families. Now, if history is to be fair, then it's clear to me that the name of Benjamin Ward needs to be listed amongst the great African American, only well, strike that American pioneers because of the groundbreaking role that he played not only in the NYPD, but in government in general, where he held many titles where he was a first. Like the African American pioneers of the 1800s, he too traveled through tough terrain and focused on doing the common public good in the face of trying times and in spite of the overt discrimination that he faced and encountered as a young police officer. The hardships that he endured makes his life and legacy equal to that of many of the African American pioneers that history often pays homage to. He, like the pioneers of the early 1800s, pushed forward into uncharted territory in search of a land that would bring new hope to those who came behind him. And as a long-standing long member of Noble, through his push through this new world, he opened doors for others and truly embodied and lived the spirit of the Noble model, justice by action. Now, I want to just take a little detour here from my notes to say, as I was outside looking at the, uh, the, the photo albums in particular, I saw one album there that was reminiscent and reflective of the conference that was held here in 1998. I'm sorry, 1988, I apologize here, that Noble had here in New York City. And President, President Travis remembers that well, as you mentioned before. You've worked for Commissioner Ward during that time. So the last conference in, that Noble had was 1988, but they had another conference here in 2008, exactly 20 years later, where I was blessed to be, I guess blessed to be, asked to be the conference chair. Um, now, upon reflection, I had a great time, but the lead up to that was very difficult because the bar was raised so high by the Wood family, by your father who told us that the way you do a conference is this way. I had to reflect back to 1988 and I got reminded by a lot of people inside here, Chief Scott, others that were here now, told me how it was done in 1988, so I had to raise the bar that high to get it done well. So now, upon reflection, it's behind me. It's behind us. It's in the record books. It's another good conference that Noble gave here in New York City. So I want to thank you and your family for all you did for us and for us having the time to be with you today. Thank you. So our next speaker is here representing uh, the Ward family um, and is also the person who has been the... Um, organizer of the effort to bring the Ward papers uh, to John Jay, and that's Mary Ward. Um, when she came, I gather that somebody who, from my staff who met her, asked her how long we've known each other. And with the possible exception of Marty Horn, I think you and I have known each other the longest that I've known anybody in this room. Well, because we met in the early 70s, that's a long time. So, because uh, uh, Ben became head of pretrial services, and. 73, something like that. Uh, and I met you soon after. And uh, we, were, we were younger then. <laughs> but Mary Ward occupies a very special place in, in my heart and, and Susan's heart and our family's heart, and uh, certainly occupied a special place in her dad's heart. So it's nice to have her here to bring greetings from the family. Mary. Good afternoon. Let me start off by saying that Jeremy is right. It was, I like to think of it as the mid-70s, but it was probably the early 70s. <laughs> and I was 
barely a child out of diapers at the time. <laughs> and he was my first boss at the Vera Institute of Justice, uh, which was located at the time at 30 East 39th Street in this small little building of an elevator that was that big that could hold 50 people, but only at 5 o'clock. <laughs> Otherwise, it was only rated for like nine people of that many, four or five, I think. It's pretty small. Anyway, um, it was a wonderful time for me. Jeremy was a, a great boss. I then um, went on to work for Wildcat and um, the criminal justice agency, which uh, Jeremy was heading up at that time. And it, it, was, it was seven summers of one great job after the next. And whenever I would come home in the evening, complain to my father about working in the 84th precinct and central booking and being in the actual jail cells with the recent detainees, as we called them. <laughs> he would say, I said, that door, dad, that door is killing me every day. I wham. And he says, ah, give it two weeks. You won't ever hear it again. And I waited two weeks, and he was right. I never heard it again. And he, he told me that suffering builds character. And I said, well, after this, I'm going to be some character. <laughs> so um, I'm talking off the head without looking at my notes here just to give you some background on how Jeremy and I met. But um, I just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I would like to thank Jeremy, of course, a longtime family friend, um, to both my father and I, to Larry Sullivan, who, oh, there he is, and the chief librarian, John Jay, for organizing this wonderful affair, commemorating the 30th anniversary of my father's swearing in as police commissioner. My father's dream job was being the PC. It was a job he began to seek as a 13-year-old living in the Ocean Hill, Brownsville section of Brooklyn. Every day, my grandfather would walk him a long distance across Brooklyn to a particular local PAL center, which I wish I could remember the name of it now, but it still exists. And he would go there to play sports and participate in the other activities. In 1939, he participated in an essay contest called Police Commissioner for a Day, and he won. And this contest is still held to this day. The winner receives a plaque, which I have, which one day I'll give to Jeremy, <laughs> and the opportunity to spend the day with the sitting police commissioner, who at that time was a man named Louis Joseph Valentine. He was police commissioner for 11 years, which is a long time even by today's standards. My father was able to sit at the Teddy Roosevelt desk um, that he would later occupy during his tenure as police commissioner. He was allowed to use a police radio to sit in on meetings with the PC and his staff. My father was so thrilled by this experience, he hung that plaque in his office as PC. He hung it in his office when he retired at home, and now it hangs in my office. And um, from that point on, from 1939 on, he was planning and plotting his way back to that office. After many years of hard work and sacrifice, his dream came true in 1984. I'm not sure if many New Yorkers are aware that there's actually two ceremonies for the police commissioner to be sworn into office. The first one is at midnight, December 31st. It's a very private, familial affair, closest friends and relatives in the mayor's office. Um, there's a picture actually out. Someone showed me a picture. Wait, Hilda, you showed me the picture, was it? Someone showed me a picture today of that event. And, um, uh, Oh, Bob, <laughs> was it you? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Getting old, memory's gone. And, um, and then the second affair is a very large public affair that's held in the Blue Room at City Hall. Um, usually, when this is uh, you know, for the supporters and friends and media, usually when I give a speech uh, about my father, I talk about the side of him very few knew, the person who all of his children called daddy. Um, for example, he was an excellent hair braider. He braided my hair every day, and he braided it really tight so it would stick out. And he taught me how to shave. Every morning, I'd stand on the toilet. He'd scrub me until I was completely squeaky clean. And I would tell him, Daddy, the brown does not come off. <laughs> don't, you don't need to rub that hard. <laughs> and we would take his old razor, you know, back in the day, the one that opened at the bottom, put the blade in. Mine had no blade. And we would, every morning, we would shave. And he taught me all the details, all the intricate moves you need to make to get a very close shave. I don't think my father noticed that I was girl <laughs> at the time. <laughs> he taught me how to change washers and be a plumber and be an electrician and lay bricks and chop down trees and you name it. And he, I, he just never clued in that I was a girl and maybe I wouldn't be using these skills. Um, but today I'd like to play a little game with you that we played during his 70th birthday, which I hope my nephew Kari remembers. He was kind of, kind of young then. 
and it was called How Well Do You Know Benjamin Ward? We played it mostly for the kids, but still, there are a lot of adults in the room. So I'll ask you just a couple of the questions that we asked the family. This was strictly to the family. Um, what was my father's favorite cookie? Any guesses? Hmm? Everybody says that. He hated them. <laughs> he liked ginger snaps. <laughs> what was his favorite cartoon? Nobody would really know this, but it was the Roadrunner. Now, you, should, you might know this one. What was his favorite car? Because he had a bunch of them. Each year, every three years, he got a new one. Same car, over and over. A Lincoln Town car. And now, this is, if you've ever been in the police commissioner's office, he has the large office. Then there's a smaller inner office that leads into the first deputy's office. Every day when my father was in one police plaza, he would have lunch there. I would often meet him there. And we would watch one particular TV show that he absolutely loved and didn't want to miss ever. And any guesses on what that could be? <laughs> no. <laughs> Worse, actually. <laughs> Worse, the love connection with Chuck Willery. <laughs> He loved that show, especially when the, these were blind dates, and when the date went bad, he was thrilled. <laughs> Those of you who know my father know that he was a huge influence on my life when I grew up. I was the only person who spent long periods of time with him during my formative years, the only one of his children. My father worked nights and went to law school during the day when I was between the ages of three and five years old. I attended law school with him every day. We had matching briefcases. Mine was sky blue. His was not. <laughs> um, we carried many books, pens, pads with us. And after class, we went to Brooklyn, Brooklyn um, Public Library in Grand Army Plaza <laughs> and studied for many, many hours. He would carefully underline his books, and so would I. I still have these books, and every word is underlined. And if I was very good and very quiet, he would take me to story time at the library. I went there most of the time. I wasn't always good. <laughs> Each day, we ended our day in our front stoop in Brooklyn, him smoking his lucky stripes, and me, my candy vice voice. And as his cigarette would burn down, I'd bite off the edge of mine so mine would stay exactly where his was. But life moves on. I went to school. He went back to working days again and um, vigorously pursuing his career. Along the way, my father was fortunate to meet many people, some of who are here today. He was mentored early on by Mr. Herb Sturz, a great friend to our family. Through Herb, we were both introduced to Jeremy at the Vera Institute of Justice. These were heady days of great civil and social change. And through my father's hard work, perseverance, and tenacity, he was able to climb the ranks of the police department, head both the state and city corrections departments, traffic department, and the housing um, police. He was a true pioneer. When my father was the first fill in the blank, at many of these positions, while my father was the first fill in the blank at many of these positions, he held. He never saw himself as that. He saw himself as a man who loved his city, the people in it, and only wanted to serve the greater good. Although my father always said my mother and I enjoyed his job as PC far more than he did, I beg to differ. My father loved his job. This is why um, after he retired and he was offered many prestigious jobs, that I, for one, begged him to take. Um, he did not. However, he did tell me that after you've been the police commissioner of the greatest city in the world, all else pales in comparison. So he quietly retired, taking a few speaking engagements, expert witness testimonials, testimonies, teaching positions here at John Jay, Brooklyn Law School, and others. And his crowning achievement was writing his autobiography, Top Cop. My father was a proud man and sometimes gruff, but you always knew exactly where you stood with him. With me, he was always hard as granite with a soft, mushy interior. Um, I'll just go off the cough here for a second as I'm looking at Bob, and it makes me think of when I would walk into that office, and Judy would be, was his secretary, and I would come in asking my father something outrageous, because the only way you could get what you wanted, you had to ask for the moon, and then he'd give you down here at the lamb, what I really would want. So I came in one day to ask him for something, probably money, knowing me. And he's like, eh, take this and be glad I gave it to you. And I, which is the amount of money that I wanted in the first place. Because <laughs> I always ask for a crazy amount. My daddy, I need $2,000. What? <laughs> take this and be glad you got it. <laughs> 
And I walked out and Judy said to me, don't you ever feel bad about the way you just work your father? I said, no. <laughs> I don't consider it that way. I'm just, oh. <laughs> I'm just kind of fine tuning him. <laughs> um, one of my fondest memories of my dad was when I was attending Boston College and he would write to me. He always ended each letter, love your dad, Benjamin Ward. <laughs> like I could ever forget who he was. My, fault, my dad was anything if not memorable. So on behalf of my mother, Olivia Ward, who turned 87 three days ago, and my entire family, especially my nephew, Kari, here in the front, who has continued my father's legacy as police commissioner in the, new, in the NYPD, I would, like, thank you, I would like to thank you all for your continuing support of a great man who you keep alive for us with your love and kindness toward us. I know my father is still smiling down on us. And in conclusion, I'd like to read just a small portion of a passage that I read at my father's funeral. He walked tall and with dignity. He was a proud man and had every right to be. Ben Ward was a one of a kind man and he'll be missed. But when we think of him, it can be with pride and yes, even happiness because he reached his goals down here. He's ready and willing to help us all from above. That's what he wanted you to know, smiles, not tears. And every once in a while, a little hello to the man who's been in our hearts and minds forever. So just for a second, right now, look up, give him a smile and say hello, not goodbye. Ben Ward walked by here. Thank you. Well, Mary, that was a very special uh, moment. And if uh, the successor to the Ben Ward legacy could stand just to say hello. And where, where are you assigned now? You're Midtown North. Midtown North. Well, we're glad to have you here. And uh, <laughs> so my, my memory is that, is, that, is that you decided when we met, you, you'd been a teacher and then decided to become a cop right under the age limit. Yes. And to, to carry on family tradition and your personal goals. So it's wonderful to have you here and hope this means a lot to you. Very good. So uh, we've been joined, speaking of police commissioners, <laughs> we've been uh, joined by uh, today's police commissioner and uh, Commissioner Bratton, I started my welcoming remarks by saying there's 30 years ago that another mayor chose another police commissioner to sit at the Teddy Roosevelt desk uh, and we're here commemorating the 30 years and the legacy of, of Ben Ward and that uh, I had a special announcement to make, which is that you've been able to arrange your schedule to be with us uh, to share some, some thoughts. So the, these are students at John Jay. These are members of the Ben Ward uh, extended family, people who have an interest in policing. Uh, and uh, as the successor to uh, the man that we're honoring today and, the, and I think in many ways carrying on his work, uh, we're delighted to have you here. So please join me in welcoming our police commissioner, Bill Bradley. <laughs> Like all of you, I am just so pleased to have been able to attend this event that uh, uh, Ben was uh, really an extraordinary individual who uh, basically we think of him as police commissioner, but he was the commissioner of everything. When you look at all the titles that talk about breaking glass ceilings throughout his whole career, it's when he didn't have all kinds of sutures and cuts on his head, be it commissioner of corrections and commissioner of trans traffic, and it was just amazing career. And I love the daughter's remarks, a, a proud man who had every right to be. Well, he certainly did. And he was certainly, as she described him, also memorable, that you could not meet Ben Ward and not remember him. And I think every one of you that had that experience can remember the first time you met him. And I know I do. I was 1986. He was in Boston. I was the then uh, superintendent of the Metropolitan Police Department. And then Governor Michael Dukakis was holding a law enforcement referendum. And Ben was uh, asked to come up and be the keynote speaker at that. And I can, with my fascination with the NYPD and all things having to do with this great city, that to be able to meet the actual commissioner, there I was, I was a superintendent of police and been in the business for a number of years, but the idea of, of, of meeting the New York City Police Commissioner, and particularly Ben in terms of as physically imposing and as impressive a speaker as he was, 
again, I have that great memory of, of that meeting with him and that uh, in conversation with him after about being uh, just an admirer of the NYPD and all the things I had heard about him. I'm also privileged, as Jeremy referenced, to sit behind the same desk that he sat behind. Now, me, for the second time, that uh, fortunately you get to uh, have a second time around sometimes, and for me that is happening now. I was very uh, pleased and happy when I sat down to see I was sitting beside another gentleman who's coming back into the NYPD who began his police career in 1969 as a a uh, police officer, a uh, patrolman, as they were known back in those days, and that's uh, Benjamin Tucker, who's going to be joining us uh, next week as the new Deputy Commissioner for Training for the uh, New York City Police Department. And we're very excited to have him back, because with the broad breadth of experience that he had much of it during uh, uh, the same time and era as Ben Ward, that uh, he's going to bring a wealth of experiences back into the NYPD to help to shape future generations. And I think Ben, in terms of his time as commissioner, was able to shape the NYPD of the 80s to help it face the challenges of the late 80s and 90s that were so significant in the city. And he was informed and he was shaped by the multiplicity of experiences he had going into the position. And the city certainly benefited by the creativity that he brought as the city first began to wrestle with the crack epidemic and so many of the other social issues that uh, the city was beginning to face. And there's so many in this room that are well aware of those. Herb Sturz, I see at the back that uh, Herb also, like Ben Ward, somebody whose imprint on this city will last uh, for many generations to come and fortunate to have uh, people of that stature. And I think uh, former Mayor David Dinkins, is, is he here yet? I know he was scheduled to. Not, oh, I'm sorry uh, for that in terms of the, the, the former mayor also, just a, an extraordinarily significant figure and somebody who was also a significant figure in my, in my life. Ben, as you know, was uh, 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 somebody that was uh, uh, very demanding in terms of uh, wanting excellence and wanting to get things done and didn't want to waste any time. And we uh, shared not only the Roosevelt desk, but we shared a driver that uh, Big Al was uh, uh, my, one of my security officer drivers. And uh, uh, Big Al uh, had worked uh, with Ben, and then he had worked uh, with Commissioner Kelly. And then I, in 1994, had Big Al as a driver also. And uh, Al, when you get Al to loosen up, he used to talk about uh, Commissioner Ward in terms of, because he was the consummate New Yorker, he knew every shortcut to get from A to Z and very demanding about, I sit in the back of the car and I don't know where the hell I am half the time, but Ben was always, take this way, take that way. And Al would talk about how uh, for all the years he knew Ben, he had a, basically the back of his head was always sore because Ben would always have uh, a rolled up magazine in his hand and when he got impatient about traffic, he'd start whacking him on the back of the head with the magazine. And you could just envision Ben uh, doing that, that that was, you know, here's the commission of, yeah, we're going to get there. And, no, so I, I have you know these memories and it, of, of not only the professional but also the, the human being, and uh, he is somebody who uh, left a stamp on this city, and uh, I think we're all fortunate for his passing through in so many different ways. And I'm so pleased that John Jay is taking this opportunity, and so are you here, to share in the opportunity to remember a singular man, a singular individual who did so much uh, for uh, his city and so much for all of us that, uh, you know, in, in, as we pass through life, you want to have a life of significance. You want to have a life of, that counts for something. And in that regard, then uh, he had quite a life because he counted for something and uh, he had a life that uh, certainly was a measurable impact. And he was the right guy at the right time in the right place. And uh, he deserved to walk proud. Thank you.